Good evening and welcome back to our Tough Question series. Tonight we're going to talk about what does the Bible say about addictive substances. Uh, this is a little different topic than one we usually, than we've been dealing with lately, um, but it's an important one. First of all, America clearly has a problem with this. Half of all adults have a family history of alcoholism. Uh, today, opioid overdoses kill more people every year than car accidents and gun violence combined. The financial cost of addiction is estimated at $600 million a year in the U.S. alone. And half of that amount, $300 million, is due only to treatment for smoking, uh, people who are, or who are chronic smokers. Now, the Bible doesn't talk about opioid use. The Bible doesn't talk about smoking tobacco, but it does say a lot about alcohol. So that's what I'm going to focus on as a way of looking at the Bible's view of, addi of addictive substances and how to make decisions regarding that period. Uh, so what I want to do is talk about everything the Bible has to say about, about alcohol. You might be surprised at what the Bible has to say. Uh, I'm really not interested in what society thinks about this issue. I'm really not interested in what our Baptist forefathers thought. What I really want to focus on is what does the Bible say and how we apply that to two big questions. Number one, should I partake in these substances? Should I drink alcohol, for instance? And number two, what is my responsibility to other people regarding this? It's not just about my own decisions and, and how this affects my body and my mind, but how does it impact others and what is my responsibility? Now let me just encourage you, because this is a complex issue and because the scriptures have a lot to say on this, please watch the entire message and don't take one part of it out of context. Uh, if you have a strong opinion on this issue already, you're probably going to really agree and want to say amen to some of the things I say and really be upset about other parts. My, my request of you is listen carefully weigh what the scriptures say. If you disagree with me, as always, I welcome your comments, your emails, your phone calls. I'd love to discuss this further. I don't think I know everything there is to know, but my earnest desire is to really examine what the scriptures say because this is a key issue. So let's start with what the Bible says about alcohol. First of all, uh, wine is talked about frequently in the scriptures. You see this, if you read the Bible at all, you see it frequently. The wine in biblical times, in the ancient world period, not just in Israel, wine was the drink of celebration. I don't think people in the ancient world drank wine every day, but whenever they were celebrating, they would bring that out. That was a big part of celebrations. Wedding feasts, for instance, holidays. Uh, it was also a drink of sacrament. So on holy occasions, it was, a, it was something you used uh, in part of holy celebrations, not as a means of getting drunk. That was a pagan uh, idea. But for instance, Passover, the, the cup they drank, the disciples and Jesus drank at the Last Supper was a cup of wine, okay? Jesus, in John chapter 2, turns water into wine. That's the first miracle recorded in Scripture. And I, can, I, I know that uh, as a young man, I, I heard some people, some old school Baptists say, well, I heard that that, that alcohol was, was really more like grape juice. They, they had it watered down so much, it was more like grape juice. Ga Jesus didn't make actual wine. And that's baloney. That, that's clearly wrong. The Bible says that the, the master of the feast, who was an expert on these kinds of things, tasted it and pronounced it the best wine he had ever tasted. Uh, so Jesus made actual wine and made good wine. Here's a couple of other scriptures you may not be familiar with. Psalm 104, verses 14 through 15. God makes grass grow for the cattle and plants for people to cultivate, bringing forth food from the earth. Wine that gladdens human hearts, oil to make their faces shine, and bread that sustains their hearts. So the Bible literally says that God is the creator of wine. God is the creator of fermented drink. And He gave it to us as a gift. He gave it to us as a way to gladden our hearts. Just like He gave us good, good steak to eat on a Saturday night, or, or watermelon in the summertime, or ice cream, or any other treat you can name. Uh, wine and, and alcohol are gifts from God to gladden our hearts. 1 Timothy 5.23, this is, these are the words of Paul to his protege Timothy, and he says, Stop drinking only water and use a little wine for your stomach and your frequent ailments. 
I can almost guarantee you've never heard a sermon about that in a Baptist church. But on the other hand, on the other hand, there are also many scriptures that warn against drunkenness. Proverbs 23, 31 through 35 is a little longer, but it's so picturesque. I, I need to read the whole thing for you. It says, Do not gaze at wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it goes down smoothly. In the end, it bites like a snake and poisons like a viper. Your eyes will see strange sights and your mind will imagine confusing things. You will be like one sleeping on the high seas, lying on top of the rigging. They hit me, you will say, but I'm not hurt. They beat me, but I don't feel it. When will I wake up so I can find another drink? And if you've ever been drunk before or if you've ever been around drunk people, you know that's an accurate description of the experience of drunkenness. And the Bible is condemning that. It's saying don't let that happen to yourself. Don't get involved in that. Ephesians 5.18 is one that I turn to often in thinking about this issue. Ephesians 5.18 says, Do not get drunk on wine, which is debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. And I like the way Paul contrasts the Holy Spirit and drunkenness, because both are things that change who we are fundamentally. When you're drinking, you become someone different. So you lose inhibitions. You, you, your personality shifts. In the same way, when you're under the under the authority and the influence of the Holy Spirit of God, that changes who you are. You become more bold. You become more wise. You become more conscious of your own sin. You become more humble. See, both alcohol and other addictive substances and the Holy Spirit change who we are. The difference is the Holy Spirit changes you into the person you should be, the person Jesus created you to be, whereas alcohol does something very different. I don't know anybody who says, I'm a better person when I'm drunk. Uh, at least if they're, if they're aware of how they act when they're drunk. We'll talk more about that in a little while. And here's one more scripture. Romans 14, 21. It is better not to eat, drink, eat meat or drink wine than it is to cause your brother or sister to fall. It's not saying that it is a sin to drink alcohol. Again, people in biblical times drank. It was not the idea of of abstaining was something so rare that people who abstained usually did so as a result of a vow, like a Nazarite. So Paul's not saying it's a sin to drink wine. He's saying if your drinking, your choice to drink, causes someone else to sin, then you shouldn't drink at all. You, you should prefer abstaining from something which is a gift from God to doing something that would cause someone else to stumble. In other words, your choice to drink or not to drink, your choice to smoke or not to smoke, your choice to engage in these behaviors comes down to not just how it affects you. So the question is not just, can I handle it myself? The question is, how does it affect others, others who see me, others who are around me? So let's just ask that first question. Let's answer that first question. Should I drink or not? Let me be frank, if you're a teenager, the answer is obvious, no, you should not. First of all, it's illegal, and Scripture is clear that we should obey God's law as often as possible unless it contradicts what God has told us to do. Secondly, let's just talk biology for a moment, physiology. If you're a teenager, your, your brain's prefrontal cortex isn't fully developed yet. That doesn't happen until your mid-20s. And what that means is, and, and I'm not talking down to you, this is just facts. This is just basic physiology. You are not yet to the point in life where self-control, impulse control, um, have been something that you're able to master. You make impulsive decisions at this stage of life. Uh, and that doesn't get better when you're drinking or when you're on some other substance. Also, it is much more likely for you at this stage of life to become addicted to something than it will be later. So let me just, let me just, let me just square with you. I, I've known a lot of people who would say to me, boy, I really regret something I did when I was a teenager and I was out with friends and we were drinking. I know I could tell you story after story like that. I can't tell you the story of anybody who says, you know what I really regret about my teenage years? I wish I would have had more alcohol to drink. Uh, that's just not the case. So let me just encourage you as a teenager to abstain. And I know that's hard. Listen, believe me, 
Uh, it's been 30 years since I've been in high school, but things haven't changed that much. I know what it is to be the only person in at the party who's not drinking. I know that wh what it is to be the only one who's not who doesn't have that shared experience of going and doing this and that. And 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 I know how that makes you feel like the odd person out. I also know, I also know that God protected me. Now I, I can't say that I completely. Uh, abstained when I was your age. There were times when uh, to comply with peer pressure when I when I drank, and thank God I found the taste of beer disgusting, and, and so I never really went further than a couple of sips. Um, but I, I'm just saying, you're not missing anything. You can save this decision for later. So what about adults? I'm, I'm assuming most of you who are watching me right now are adults. So what about us? What about the decisions we make? I, I've already said alcohol is not evil. Alcohol, drinking on its own is not sin. You cannot make the biblical argument that drinking alcohol on its own is a sin. But the, you can say the same thing about sex. Sex is a gift from God. Uh, sex is something that He gave us to make us happy. But we all know there are rules for that. That doesn't mean that anyone can have any sex they want any time they want. There are, there are, God intended that for specific purposes and specific relationships and specific people. So how do we make the decision? Well, you have to make your own decision for yourself, and I urge you to do that prayerfully and led by the Holy Spirit. Let me just share with you three reasons why I, as an adult, abstain from alcohol and from other addictive behaviors. Uh, number one, I know myself. I know how hard it is for me to represent Christ well. I know how sinful my heart is, how selfish I can be, how lacking in wisdom I tend to be. And that's when I'm stone cold sober. I don't think putting a, a substance into my body that removes inhibitions and makes me act differently is going to make that process better. And, and since I really want to represent Christ well, I don't see any benefit to drinking. That's reason number one. Number two. I think my wife is okay with me telling you this. Uh, there is a history of addiction, some history of addiction in her family. There have been some members further back in her, uh, in her family tree who struggled with addiction of various kinds. And I don't know if that's hereditary, but both of us as a mom and dad, we, we worry or, or we're concerned that maybe that genetic predisposition could be passed down to one or, one or more of my kids. And I don't want them to grow up seeing their dad drinking and think, oh, well, there's no big deal. I can just, I can drink all I want. Um, and then third, so, so there's me as a Christian, there's me as a dad, and third, there's me as a pastor. And I realize that's something you don't share, but I, I'm privileged to pastor a really wonderful church, but that comes with some responsibilities. My life is not my own. I, if, if someone sees me publicly drinking, certainly if anyone sees me drunk, that's that's going to be a big problem uh, for me as a pastor. That, that really hurts my ministry and the ministry of the entire church. But even if they just see me with alcohol, that may, that may cause someone to stumble, someone who struggles as, a, as an alcoholic or with another addictive behavior. I have to think about these things. For me, the, the reward that comes with drinking is not worth the risk of those three factors that I named. Now, I don't think that makes me a better person than people who do drink. I mean, obviously, if I thought I was better than people who, who feel free to drink alcohol, then I'm saying I'm better than Jesus and his apostles who drank wine. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying you need to make your decision prayerfully. And let me share with you one more scripture in helping you make that decision. 1 Corinthians 6, 12 says, I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything but I will not be mastered by anything. So what Paul's doing there is he's, he's parroting the, the mindset of a lot of Christians that says, hey, I'm free to do whatever I want. I'm free in Christ. I'm not bound by the law anymore. But Paul says, that doesn't mean everything you choose to do is good. And then he says, don't be mastered by anything. That word mastered literally means enslaved. Don't let anything enslave you. And that's talking about idolatry, but it's also talking about addiction. Because the very nature of addiction is bondage. It's, I have to have this. I cannot live without this. And I want to say something right now that I passionately believe. And that is that 
America, perhaps more than ever before in its history, America has a serious problem with alcohol today. And the reason I say that, alcoholism rose in the U.S. by 49% in the first 10 years of this century alone. 49% in 10 years. I don't know what it's done since 2000, between 2010 and, and today, but I doubt it's gotten any better. And this is another one that just blows me away. One in eight Americans is an alcoholic. Just think about that. One in eight. That's a staggering number. And I could give you more numbers, but I don't need to because I go to football games. And, and I love going to football games, but what I observe at football games and other sporting events is, is two things. Number one, there's a whole lot of people in our society, a whole lot of people, who feel like they cannot enjoy themselves without drinking. Secondly, in fact, to the point where um, when we have games that start at 11 a.m., people complain because that's too early for them to uh, get sufficiently drunk before the game starts. And that's a problem. They feel like they can't enjoy themselves without it. Number two, people today, a lot of people, this is what I observe in the stands around me, don't realize how ridiculous they behave when they're drinking. They just don't understand. And I know this because I see these people apart from football games sometimes, and they're good people. They're people who are educated, people who are trained, people who have responsible jobs and, and are good moms and dads. And uh, these are people who, who are, who are high-functioning individuals, and yet they go to this game, and for four hours, they act like a moron. In, in fact, I, I've had the thought often during a game if I could videotape you and send you that video on Monday when you're at your office and you're stone cold sober and you saw how you were acting, it would horrify you. So America has an alcohol problem because there's a bondage there that says, number one, I cannot enjoy myself without it. Number two, I don't realize how it affects me. And so what I'm urging you to do is, if you are someone who, who, who tends toward the idea that, yeah, I can drink, it's fine for me. The Bible doesn't forbid it, I like the taste of it, it's good for me socially. I want you to do me a favor and do yourself a favor. Talk to someone who knows you well. Talk to someone who will be honest with you, someone who's not afraid to confront you, and just ask them the honest question. If you've been around me before when I've been drinking, how do I act? Do, do I, is there anything I need to know? Would I be better off if I cut back or cut it out entirely? Be honest with yourself. Ask someone this honest question and make the decision prayerfully. Make the decision honestly. Okay, so that's number one. Should I drink or not? Again, it's up to you. It's between you and the Lord, but, but make it responsibly. The second question though is, what is my responsibility to others? Again, it's not just about I can handle it. How does it affect others, your decision, your choice? So, two things I would say. My responsibility on the issue of addictive behaviors, number one, don't be a Pharisee. Now, I say this as a person who's a lifelong Baptist. I never heard a, a sermon about alcohol growing up, but I knew what the expectation was. Uh, I, it was pretty obvious. And if I didn't know, then other people, non-Baptists, told me what I was supposed to believe about this subject. And honestly, in my grandparents' generation, this was something that was talked about quite a bit more. In fact, if I preached the message in a Baptist church that, I just, that I've been delivering to you 50 years ago, I'd probably get fired because people 50 years ago in Southern Baptist churches expected a message that was completely against alcohol, that condemned the practice, that condemned anyone who engaged in it. Um, but that didn't make that generation of Baptists morally superior. I mean, uh, let's be honest, a lot of Southern Baptists of that generation also supported racial segregation. They were good people in many ways, but they were flawed. So being anti-alcohol or abstaining from alcohol doesn't make you morally superior. Don't get that idea in your mind. The reason I'm saying all this is I think our church, in fact, I know our church and any church needs to be a safe place for people to come and say, I'm struggling with addiction and I need help. No one should ever feel ashamed to, to be able to, should never feel like, well, I'll be judged, I'll be rejected. Even if you've been a member of the church for 40, 50 years and you've kept this to yourself all that time, you should feel free 
you should feel free to, to come to a trusted Christian friend, to a deacon, to a life group leader, to one of us on ministry staff and say, hey, I know you don't know this about me. I've been keeping it hidden, but I've been struggling with addiction and I need help. And you should know, you should know going in that when you say that, what you're going to receive in return is love and support and true help. So number one, don't be a Pharisee. Let's make our church that kind of congregation. Number two, be courageous enough to confront. So don't judge, but at the same time, that doesn't mean live and let live. We need to be courageous enough to confront those who are struggling with addiction and maybe aren't honest enough with themselves to admit it. And I'll tell you a story. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was going to preach on this very subject. It was part of a series I was doing on Sunday mornings and I remember I went out to eat with my wife and Carrie and I were sitting there talking about the sermon series that was coming up and I was telling her, yeah, I was planning to do one on addiction, um, but I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I should. I was having second thoughts about preaching on this subject and I didn't realize this, but our waitress had walked up right before that and so she overheard me say those words and she interrupted me and she said, oh, you should definitely preach that sermon. Now, this waitress knew that we went to that restaurant pretty frequently. She knew that I was a pastor and she proceeded to tell me, she said, my dad is an alcoholic and he's, he's gotten in fights when he's been drunk. I've had to bail him out of jail. Um, when he's drunk, he's no fun to be around. Uh, I won't bring my daughter around if, if we show up at the house and, and he's been drinking, I take her home because he's so mean. He's so scary that it terrifies his granddaughter and, and he loves this girl. But when he's drinking, he's a different man. And she said, and I've tried to talk to him, but he doesn't believe me. He doesn't believe that, I, that he acts this way when he's drinking. She said, I just wish that somebody his age, someone, a fellow uh, man, would confront him and tell him the truth. And I just wonder how many people we know who are like that. People who, we see them and we see the signs of addiction and we say, well, it's none of my business. You know, I've got my own flaws. How dare I get involved? But love means getting in someone's face sometimes. It's not just being nice. Love means bearing each other's burdens. And part of that is rebuking those who are struggling, rebuking those who need to repent. So pray for the, for the courage to confront and speak words of honest truth. Now, let me just close by saying this. Scripture tells us, that once upon a time, you and I were in bondage ourselves. Whether you've ever struggled with physical addiction or not, we've all known the bondage of being slaves to sin. We were mastered by our sin nature. We could not help ourselves. We tried to be good, but we couldn't help ourselves. We were stuck. And God could have looked the other way. Just like we pass by people who need to be confronted and decide not to get involved. God could have made that same decision, but He did. He intervened in the most powerful, personal way of all. He actually took our bondage upon Himself. He became sin, according to 2 Corinthians. He became sin. He who knew no sin became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. In other words, He brought us freedom by putting Himself in bondage. Let's live in that freedom. Let's enjoy that freedom. Let's rejoice in what Christ has paid such a high cost to give us. Isn't it good to, to serve a God who loves us that much? Isn't it good that the news we have to give is good news? Y'all have a great week. Continue to stay safe. Keep, uh, keep each other in your prayers and keep checking on one another. And just know uh, Christ loves you more than you can possibly know. God bless you. Have a great week. Thank you.